G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy for yet another trade update. We've passed day four, I think, of the trade period, and gee, it started slow like it always does. Very typical start to the trade period, but the fact we actually got some player deals done today, uh, that actually might be a record. I don't know how many times we've had this many deals in day three or four. It feels like there's always a lot of posturing and a lot of negotiating before uh, these player deals actually go down, so it's nice to say we actually got some decent news out of today. So I'm recording this at the end of the third day of the trade period. That's right, it's Wednesday, so it must have been the third day of the trade period. And even though as I upload this, is probably some new news as well, uh, but I'm gonna do a bit of a wrap of the deals that went down today and just give my general thoughts on them. As I say very often, guys, I really appreciate all the support and all the response to the trade period action videos that I've been doing. It still appears that still less than half of you who watch the videos and appear to enjoy them have actually subscribed to the channel. So if you could take the two seconds to subscribe to the channel, it would really help me hit the goals I have for growing this channel. And as a lot of you know, I'm very ambitious with it. So I must ask you to subscribe. That's not going to help, is it? Anyway, we'll kick into the trade period deals that went down today. Uh, almost a little bit surprisingly, Jeremy Finlayson made his way to Port Adelaide. And when I say surprising, it's not because we didn't know he was on the move. We did know he was on the move, but it seemed up in the air where he was going to end up. In fact, in my last couple of videos, I suggested perhaps it was a bit more likely he would go to a Victorian club that would uh, need a tall presence up forward. But he's nominated Port Adelaide. They've traded a future third round pick for him. And that all happened pretty quickly because, yeah, as I said, didn't seem super clear where he was going to end up. We know that Finlayson was keen to move uh, somewhere. I guess he had sort of nominated Port. He did have a, uh, a medical with them during the week. I think his partner is from South Australia, so that does make sense, but it seemed like he had a couple of different pools in a few different states. So despite the fact that he's contracted to the Giants for a further two seasons, he made his way to Port Adelaide. It's a bit of a blow for the Giants. I don't think they're flush with tall forward talent. I think they just re-signed Riccardi and uh, Jesse Hogan looks decent, although he's still a bit of a wild card. So obviously still trying to replace Jeremy Cameron and all the goals he would kick. And Jeremy Finlayson was a good player at least a couple of years ago. He bagged 44 goals in the year they made the grand final. So it is definitely a bit of a loss, but you can understand why his value wasn't that high. And there's obviously a bit of a sympathetic approach for, I would say, getting him for unders what he's worth considering he's contracted. But again, you've got a player who wants to move for family reasons. So you've got to do the right thing by the player. It's an interesting move on the grounds that I've said this before, but I don't know if Finn Lason actually starts for Port Adelaide. And Port Adelaide fans can let me know in the comments what they think about that, but probably had some of their own issues just trying to get their forward talls mix right this year. They've obviously got Georgie Artis and Todd Martin. Marshall competing for a spot themselves, and now you add Finn Lace into that. The good thing for them is uh, he's in his prime, but he's still only 25, 26, and a known goal kicker, so he could sort of add a good foil to the tall forwards that they have down there already. At the end of the day, they're contending, and if a player gets injured, it's good to have Finn Lace in, in the team, and I suspect that the fact that he's moving for, you know, off-field reasons, he's probably accepted the fact to some extent that he's an outside chance to start round one, so all in all, that's a very, very good value deal for Port Adelaide, and it gives them crucial depth as I think they will go deep again next year, most likely. Another deal that went down that was a little bit of a surprise again, not because we didn't know this player was moving, but we didn't know where Luke Dunstan was going to end up. In fact, out of the clubs he was linked to, uh, I don't think Melbourne had even come up until, you know, maybe 12, 24 hours ago. It makes sense when you think about it. We thought he might be going to a Gold Coast Suns, or I think I'd nominated Port Adelaide as that mature depth for a team in contention. And Dunstan's from South Australia, so there's that added link as well. But I believe, according to Sam Edmund, he turned down offers from both the Gold Coast Suns. Admittedly, I think that was going to be a rookie selection because they have their own salary cap issues and an unnamed developing club as well, a team that's rebuilding. And he highlighted the fact that the play the kids threat was a big factor in Dunstan not going to a rebuilding team. And the logic behind that is, of course, if a team starts to suddenly rebuild and want to play their kids, or if they're already doing that, then it makes it harder for a mature guy like Dunstan, who I think is 27 next year, to hold his spot in the side. So he's gone to Melbourne, who needs some maybe midfield depth. I guess Nathan Jones has just retired. And again, Dunstan's going to start outside the 22, you think, but he's joining a club that's right in the peak of their powers just about, or we, we don't really know what this uh, Melbourne team's going to become, but they've won the flag. So the point I'm getting to is Dunstan's actually given himself a good chance of potentially being a premiership player within 12 months from now. I think Melbourne are very well placed 
to go back to back, to be honest. And you contrast that with, you know, a rookie list spot at the Gold Coast Suns. It makes perfect sense why Dunstan would want to stay in Melbourne and fight for his spot in the best team in the league. One of the more intriguing deals that we got news of today, it hasn't formally gone through, but it sounds like the Gold Coast Suns will be sending pick 19 and Will Brody to Fremantle for a future pick swap that will likely be in Gold Coast favor, but not too much. I did talk about in a previous video, the uh, the story that perhaps North were going to acquire Darcy McPherson, take on his 400 K salary and acquire pick 19 in Gold Coast salary dump. I'd probably explain it a little bit better in that previous video if you want to go watch that. But sounds like that deal's off. North Melbourne are no longer interested. I presume it doesn't sound like either party is keen on that. So McPherson's more likely to stay at the Gold Coast Suns. And instead, Gold Coast are using Will Brody as a way of freeing up some salary cap. So according to reports, Will Brody's on about $600,000 a year. And this is a guy that's starting outside their 22. I've talked about it previously, but this is obviously the case where Gold Coast have a lot of youth that they want to to hold on to and of course a salary cap floor that they need to meet so they actually need to pay their players a little bit more even though they're not as good and Will Brody being a top 10 pick and a Victorian kid as well they obviously sort of tried to cash in early by offering a front-ended contract he hasn't turned out he's obviously behind guys like Raul and Anderson Took Miller he's, it's actually a tough midfield to break into for a young guy doesn't mean he's no good but obviously he's not a big focus for the Gold Coast Suns and let's face it at $600,000 a year He's not a really valued spot on the list, I would suggest, for the Gold Coast. So Fremantle, obviously, losing some plays in recent years, have a bit of salary cap freed up. You know, Jesse Hogan would have been on a pretty penny. Lockie Neal as well. Maybe Rory Lobb goes the other way. Probably not. But either way, they've got the cash to spend. They're probably going to front end his contract. And not only that, they get pick 19, which is the craziest thing of this. Fremantle end up with pick 19 for taking a player off another club's hands because they're willing to pay his salary. And that's amazing business by Fremantle. I, I'm very complimentary of the way they go about their business because I think they've done very well in the deals that they've done over the last three years. Pick 19 as well is going to be crucial most likely because I think that will unlock the Jordan Clark deal. There's been a bit of talk that they may request something else alongside Clark in exchange for the pick. But either way, it's a lot more attractive to Geelong to get that pick 19 because it was pointed out as well. It's the first selection of day two of the draft. So for those who don't follow the draft closely, you get the first round on the first night. They make it a bit of a showcase. And on the second night, the second round kicks off. And the effect of that is that if you have pick one essentially on the second day, then you've got that held 12, 24 hours, whatever it's to field live trade offers because you can trade picks live as well. So instead of the usual five minutes where they're on the clock and maybe they're getting a call from clubs who want to trade up, if teams have a whole, I don't know, 20 hours to, to sort of mull it over, look at their lists, weigh up whether a trade would be valuable, suddenly Geelong, if they end up with this pick, have a pick that is going to be highly sought after. They may actually get a pretty value live trade out of it. We saw it a couple of years back. I think it was with Devin Robertson, who was the first pick of day two. There was a trade, I think, from Port Adelaide to the Brisbane Lions. Brisbane knew they wanted their men and they had a lot of time to sort of negotiate that deal. So long story short, it's most likely going to be pick 19 and a bit for Jordan Clark and Geelong hold a very valuable pick in this year's draft. Another eye-catching trade that happened throughout today was a massive four-team multi-pick trade that is going to be really, really hard to break down, but I'll give it a bit of a crack. The surprising part was that the Demons ended up holding pick 17. We'd been talking throughout the week or even the previous weeks about how Dogs were almost certainly going to trade pick 17, and I thought, you know, teams like Richmond or Adelaide in particular were going to go hard after this pick because the Bulldogs want to trade down so they can get more points to get Sam Darcy. But it's the Demons that have traded back into the first round. And this is actually the third year in a row they've traded into the first round quite aggressively. I think in the last couple of years they landed Kaziah Pickett and I think it was Bowie as well. So that's potentially two premiership players if I've got that right. So they've kind of been vindicated for those selections. There's obviously a kid in this draft that they really want, which I found quite interesting as well. Considering they're a team, you know, right in the thick of the premiership race, they're still well and truly thinking about this particular draft. The Crows ended up with a future first rounder and I presume that's going to Sydney. Uh, because the Crows now hold 4 and 33 in this year's draft. So you can almost write off the fact that Adelaide didn't trade anything from this draft for Jordan Dawson. I'd imagine that pick four is not going anywhere. So it's a future first, but it's Melbourne's future first. And that means if Melbourne go deep again, that's likely a pick in the 20s, which is around about what they had to begin with. So I think that can't possibly be the only part of this deal. Maybe they intend to, you know, trade that future first again before they get a deal done for Jordan Dawson. But I feel like a future first, which would say, let's say, pick 20 or pick 19 and 33, still not a great deal from Sydney's perspective. So it'd be interesting to see what happens there. 
Apparently, Adelaide had previously negotiated with the Bulldogs for their pick 17, which is a little bit closer to Jordan Dawson's value, but Melbourne swooped in late to steal that pick, which is uh, quite an interesting thing to watch, and this trade with Dawson is going to get very, very complicated. There are some other bits of news that came out of today. The Dogs are set to sign Tim O'Brien as an unrestricted free agent. I think he was also linked to Port Adelaide, but it was a case of Finn Lason or O'Brien, not both. It's probably going to be as a defender because the Dogs could probably use a little bit of consolidation in their back half. O'Brien probably hasn't really settled on his position. I think he played forward a lot for Hawthorne this year, but he's proven that he can play as a defender. It's still not a long-term solution. I think they probably need to look at trading in a proper tall key back with Alex Keith, you know, a little bit undersized, even though he's a good player. He's also about 29, I think, years old, and Tim O'Brien's probably not a long-term solution either. So either way, you've got to respect the fact that the Dogs have highlighted a list need in the here and now, and they're obviously in contention too. So this could pan out pretty well for them. At the end of the day, it's going to cost virtually nothing. So Kilda also may have found an answer to their ruck depth. Uh, they obviously want some depth behind Ryder and Marshall, and it looks like Tristan Cherry from North Melbourne has requested a trade. He's sort of a ruck forward. Um, he's played 12 games as a 22-year-old. Don't really know too much about him, but I guess if you played 12 games at the age of 22 as a ruck, you must have something there that is potentially AFL level. Obviously, St. Kilda see that, and North Melbourne have Tom Campbell and Todd Goldstein, and obviously can't really offer any game time right now for someone like Cherry as well. So a bit of a small deal that happened there. And it wouldn't be a true footy video without me working West Coast into it in some capacity, but I think it is a little bit interesting that there seems to be absolutely no interest for Jared Brander. It's not really that I'm shocked, but it's just funny how this sort of situation has unfolded. It seems like Jared Brander kind of decided a little while ago that he wasn't going to want to play for the Eagles. I suspect that's why he stopped getting games even when we had injuries in the second half of the year. Former first round draft pick, I don't know how hard the Eagles fought to keep him. I thought he was probably going to be worth a pick in the 40s or a 50. And to be honest, that's a loss for a guy who was a former first round draft pick, played out of position, key position player, in my opinion, probably has the tools to make it at AFL level. But that being said, uncontracted, didn't play a lot this year in this back half. So I understand that's how trade value works. But the narrative has seemed to have changed from Brando and his manager saying, you know, we want out, we've got you know, teams offering us contracts to now where Carlton sort of briefly had an interest. They don't want him anymore because they've got uh, Lewis Young. Geelong were really, really pushing for Brandon to be part of the Tim Kelly deal a couple of years back, but um, obviously they don't seem to be linked to him at all. Same with Hawthorne. I think they had brief interest. Sam Mitchell obviously knows Jared Brander. No interest at all. So it seems like it could be a funny scenario where Brander has to come back with his tail between his legs and potentially negotiate a one-year deal with West Coast at the end of all this. To be honest, I think if, if it really is as like a delisted free agent or something, there is value in picking up Brander for some club. But at the end of the day, teams don't know much about him, I guess, and it's tight for list spots. But for some of the players that are moving around the league, you know, your Lockie Youngs and your, your Tristan Cherries, I would have thought there would be a bit more interest for Brander. But at the end of the day, I'm more than happy to take him on on a one-year deal. It'll be interesting to see if he's burned his bridge with West Coast. But anyway, guys, that is my thoughts on the deals that went down today. Probably won't get another trade update done tomorrow. I do have another video coming out tomorrow reviewing the 2018 trade period and looking at how all the deals went down. Most likely it'll be a Saturday job or potentially later. So either way, hope you're sticking fat with the channel. I really appreciate you subscribe if you haven't already. Like the video if you'd enjoyed it and I'll see you in the next video guys. Cheers.